preparing to live stream the meeting. Now in a moment, we're going to hear the echo preparing, back. Preparing to live stream the meeting. And we are going to mute the sound on the YouTube. And now, we are recording live YouTube. And I will send you both, uh, Andre and Hartman, the, um, the link to the YouTube, which will be on our, our official channel, called Community Church of Boston Official. You can find it there. So here we are at 11 a.m. on the dot and starting punctually. Welcome to Community Church. My name is Dean Stevens. I am called the interim administrator of Community Church of Boston, but mostly I think of myself as a longtime member and guitar player, music director. Um, start out today with a reading from the founder of the church. 100 years ago, this church came together, uh, founded by Reverend Clarence Skinner, um, amazing theologian and preacher. And this is a quote from him. Out of the world's wide ways we come to this, our house of fellowship and aspiration. Here may the evils which beset us be banished by the power of justice. The fears that haunt us be overcome by fresh insight. The doubts that drive us be dissolved into finer faith. Here each in our own way, yet together, let us for a brief time look into the mysteries of life's beginning, the source out of which the endless eons roll and countless lives emerge, and with renewed hope search through this maddening maze of things to find again life's aim and life's meaning, and above all, its glory. That's from Reverend Clarence Skinner, our founder. We welcome you all to this, our Sunday morning, we're broadcasting here. I'm by myself in this lonely auditorium from Copley Square, which we recognize used to belong to the ocean. The fishies used to swim under here before it was filled in for real estate land. And on the banks of these waters, the Massachusetts fished. There are, uh, there are archaeological digs that have found fish weirs in the Boston Common, which is about two blocks to our east. We recognize with, with dignity and humility that this is native land. And we start out with the words of last year's presenter at Indigenous Peoples Day. His name is Tom Pacheco, and it was my first encounter with Tom, and as a songwriter, I have become totally enamored, enamored with his music and have learned countless of his songs. And this is the one I knew before I found out about Tom's just incredible body of, of, of songs that he've, he's written, a couple of thousand over a 50-year um, trajectory. Tom is, is Lakota by his mother and Portuguese by his father, born and raised in New Bedford. And this might be his best known song. It's written, co-written with Roland Moussa, Indian Prayer. As long as the wind shall blow, as long as the grass shall grow, as long as the streams shall flow, as long as the sun shall glow, this land, this land shall be the Indian. As long as the bird shall sing, as long as the black bear dreams, as long as the mountains ring with life, every brand new spring, this land shall be the Indian. As long as the last star shines as far as the end of time, and here I pause to, to point out the last two sunflowers from my garden that I brought to put in front of, I hope you can see them, in front of our, our banner, and because this line says, as long as the sunflower tries to touch and embrace the sky, this land, this land shall be the Indian. 
As long as the buffalo appear in a dream of snow, like God's moving stately slow, and go where the rainbows go, this land, this land shall be the land I love. As long as the wildest rain falls down on the driest plain and fills every river vein and rolls to the sea again, this land shall be the Indian. From Tom Pacheco. Thank you, Tom Pacheco, for inspiring me like crazy this year. And on this day, we have two wonderful new presenters I hope they don't mind if I call them what I heard John Trudell once call them, two young bucks. Welcome to Community Church. And I want to introduce um, uh, our song keeper for this morning. It's, it's been great meeting Andre and finding out about a one-year-old who, who is in his house, whose name is Amaya. Andre Strong Bear Heart Gaines is a citizen of the Nipmuc people. He serves as a cultural steward for his tribe, is a father, public speaker, traditional dancer, indigenous activist for indigenous rights, carpenter, union carpenter, I will mention, by trade and educator. With over a decade in recovery from drugs and alcohol, Andre is a recovery sponsor an integrated life coach for those in need. Andre's work focuses on bringing traditional knowledge back to indigenous peoples. Some of this consists of how to flesh and brain tan hides to make items such as drums, buckskins, and blankets. This work is focused on cultural revitalization and preservation. Andre's work is grounded in restoring balance between everyday life and traditional values while navigating the colonial systems we live in. He considers family, culture, and traditions to be the three most important aspects within life. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Andre, for sending it to me so I could read it to you. Welcome to, to Community Church of Boston. Hey, Akuni. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me this morning. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Can folks hear Andre? All right. Um, I just want to say, Kwe Motapanwani, Natasawas Minikisu Maskmata. And my language, I just want to say, you know, how, how are you? Good morning. And my name is Strong Bearheart. Uh, this morning, I was asked to sing some, some songs, and I want to just speak on these songs real quick. Uh, the song that I'm going to sing right now is an honor song. Um, given that we're at the time of the 400 year whatever you want to call it. Some call it an anniversary, some call it a celebration, some call it a, an arrival. I know that for us, it, uh, it strikes a, a, a certain place. It's a reminder of the way things were before the arrival. And, um, so I want to sing this honor song because a lot of my people who are in pain and um, in, in the light of, you know, around this 400 year anniversary or arrival. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping that we can bring awareness and we can bring true knowledge and true history into the uh, aspects and um, whether it's the criteria or whether it's just the, the basic knowledge of people on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, um, as a union carpenter, I'm constantly working through Boston and, and um, areas like that. And so I'm always faced with the situation and where I have to explain about where we are and what territory we're in and the way things are used to be here. And like, um, it's easy for us to, to think back, like for, for most, they think that it's just like a, a piece of history um, that is easily forgotten. But for us, I mean, I know on our reservation in, in Hassanamissic, which is in Grafton, Massachusetts, there's, there's a tree 300 years old, um, the black oak tree. And so, you know, it's not too far fetched that our ancestors from three, 400 years ago, I mean, we can still look at things on the earth that are still here that are that old. And so, um, it's still very relevant for us. Um, it still strikes a certain place in our spirit and in our heart. 
and we speak of these things. And so I know people take it lightly and they tell us to move on, but, you know, we want to make it known that, uh, you know, before you can move on, there needs to be some sort of reconciliation or there needs to be some sort of, you know, America itself hasn't spoke on what's happened here. You know, it happened with the indigenous aboriginals in Australia. See, they spoke on what happened there, the government. Uh, it still hasn't happened here. You can't even find our language in the Algonquin uh, in Google search engines, you know, um, which is interesting because Google search is the highest search engine. So, um, yeah, I find that really interesting that, you know, the first Bible that was printed here was in Algonquin, and yet you can't even find our language in a simple Google Translate. You gotta ask yourself why that is. They need to continue to bury our uh, our past and history that's happened here instead of looking at it face on and uh, you know being able to admit the faults and to move on and begin to heal. So, and that with that being said, I just want to sing this healing song to start off. That I'm hoping that you know um, with this time that uh, some of us and hopefully the majority of most of us can start to heal again before we can start to rebuild again. Oh! 
say thank you to be able to sing that song for you know for our people my people your people for all people because in this time that we're in right now there's a real need for healing and uh i just want to say thank you and so yeah thank you andre strong bear heart gains jr there is a healing in this place just the fact that we're together here in this strange virtual way is where healing starts. Healing not only of our own physical things going on inside us, the fact that entropy is setting in and we are all just on the way downhill, some of us closer to, to that goal than, than others, but this is, this is what gives us strength and, and power. Not only that kind of healing, but healing of, of the planet and healing of uh, the deep half a millennial pain of, of colonialism and genocide. We light this candle, candle of unity, hope, strength. I hope I don't blow it out. Here's the candle that we always light at the beginning of our gathering. It's, it's a little bit funny um, being what's, what's called the interim administrator of the church. It's, it's that I get to be a, a, a fake minister. Um, and if, my, my favorite part of this uh, is uh, selecting readings. And uh, this book has really, has really hit pay dirt for me as far as, as this. Eduardo Galeano is from Uruguay, and he has written many um, books in, in this form that is small uh, vignettes that are history, and and sort of poetry wrapped all into one and this is sort of a day book it's kind of like when i was an evangelical uh, child coming up in a in a very religious um, uh, family we would read the daily light every every day after dinner just a, a little little reading of some kind so this is this is a, a version of that uh, and the, so the book is called children of the days eduardo galeano and this is what it has uh for for today very apropos it says the discovery in 1492 the natives discovered they were indians they discovered they lived in America. They discovered they were naked. They discovered there was sin. They discovered they owed obedi obedience to a king and a queen from another world and a God from some other heaven. And this God had invented guilt and clothing and had ordered burned alive all who worshiped the sun and the moon and the earth and the rain that moistens it. That reading is from Eduardo Galeano, Children of the Days. I'd be glad to, uh, to forward that to anyone who'd like um, just be in touch with, uh, with me or, or with the church. Um, he always has wisdom to impart for every day, Eduardo Galeano. Um, I wanna also mention one other thing, which is that um, some of the focus of this year's Indigenous Peoples Day is on the uh, statue of 
uh, of Christopher Columbus that lost its head in the midst of all of that um, racial turmoil back a couple of months ago. Um, and I want to mention to you that one week ago, there was a um, there was an article in last Sunday's Globe. Um, I don't have the article in front of me, but uh, our clerk, Dick Kashishin, mentioned it to me and sent it to me in the mail. But basically the gist of the article is something we've been working on for a long time, which is that a statue of Christopher Columbus should be replaced with a statue of our longtime patron saints, Sacco and Vanzetti. Sacco and Vanzetti uh, are uh, memorialized in two ways. Right here in our auditorium, we have a, a very beautiful bas relief on the wall of, of Sacco and Vanzetti with a quote from, from um, Bartolome Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Um, we also have a list of our annual um, uh, award winners of the Sacco and Vanzetti Memorial Award which we give out once a year to uh, some notable social, social activist with a focus on the suffering that they've, um, their lives has, has, has incurred as a result of their activism. The first one I mentioned who received it in 1991 is Leonard Peltier. We had him by phone here. Another one is Mumia Abu-Jamal. Um, another one, is, the very first one was named William Kunzler in the early 70s when we started giving out this award. Um, and many other, uh, a list that you can find on our website. And the, the exciting thing is that we're giving one this December, December 13th to be exact, to Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg who uh, gave to the world the Pentagon Papers. Um, uh, exposing what the war in Vietnam really was and, um, and getting himself indicted as a result. Something similar to the, the situation with um, Julian Assange and um, Chelsea Manning and Ed Snowden right now, whistleblowers, all of them uh, just notable for what they have done for all of us and how they have suffered. Um, that's the Sacco and Vanzetti Award. And um, we are also um, embarking on a, on a new venture for Community Church, which is that we are taking over the responsibility of, of um, something called the Sacco and Vanzetti Commemoration Society, uh, that whose main object is to, to place a monument in the North End, which is the Italian section of Boston, to the memory and the honor of Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, there are several members of that society who, uh, who we've joined. We had a, a really wonderful um, symposium in late summer on Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, and uh, so we will be joining forces with them and with the Dante Alighieri Society in uh, trying to set up a public monument to them. It's not a difficult, it's not an easy thing. Public art is always difficult and controversial. Um, as you will perhaps know about a, an, an effort that was made to, to erect a monument at Faneuil Hall to the slaves that were traded in that place. Uh, it, before it was a, um, a, a food court, Faneuil Hall was, was a slave auction place. Uh, and there was, uh, there was an effort to, to put in a memorial there, but it, 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 when it came into all kinds of controversies and, and difficulties and was eventually, hopefully not canceled, but postponed. Um, so those are my long-winded introductory comments. And um, I just welcome you all. There are now um, 19 participants on this Zoom call and uh, another, uh, let's see, uh, probably 
25 more uh, watching live on YouTube. If I'm not mistaken, where is that number? I, I can't find that number any now, but uh, I, I won't bother to, to find that number. You will be able to see it eventually on YouTube because it will be archived in our YouTube channel, which is called Community Church of Boston Official, our official channel. And with that, I want to welcome back Andre Strongheart Gaines Jr. Thank you, Andre, again for, for being with us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with that being said, um, I'm going to sing a, a round dance song. This would have been something that we would all come together with. It's kind of tough to sing these songs without having people come together, but uh, I'm going to do it <laughs> because I think in this, like you said, we are together just in a strange virtual way these days. So. Normally, people would have come together in hand, hand in hand, and they would have, um, they would have been. Can you hear me? Oh. Okay. Yeah. And um, this would have been a time of togetherness. This would have been a time of putting everybody on the same plateau. It would have um, linked everybody together in in a certain way that. Um, people just don't do now. Um, people don't even know each other's, their neighbor's names, never mind coming together and being in the same wavelength. You know, we knew traditionally that we needed each other more than just people across the street. We needed each other to survive. There was a certain togetherness. And so um, I think about those things when I sing songs like this. And, you know, I pray that at some point you know, our communities, our people all come back together hand to hand and really begin to rely on each other in beautiful ways. Oh, yeah. 
that's a roundy. We would have brought our people together, even sometimes traditionally. Um, elders might have put those young ones who were fighting hand in hand. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, great stories with these songs because they're so old. And so depending on where you sing them and they might change just a little bit from territory to territory, but these are our Eastern Woodland social songs and they mean everything to us. So thank you for letting me share that. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Andre, a quick question about your drum. Is that, is that a, a, a cow hide or buffalo hide? Or? Yeah, uh, well, traditionally here in the East, we would have had water drums, which I do have. But today I have my, my hand drum and it is a buffalo skin, yes. With a homunky onk mosque, which is my daughter, that's her handprint and her feet print. I don't know if you can see in the screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, beautiful. I think about her a lot when I'm singing the songs. So. Yeah, yeah, wow. Thank you, Andre. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Hartman Dietz. Hartman came to us through his spiritual grandmother, who is probably watching on YouTube, if I'm not mistaken, um, Anne Gilmore, uh, a frequent attendee to, to this church, uh, especially on occasions involving Native people. Uh, which we do uh, on, on this Indigenous Peoples Day as well as on National Day of Mourning, aka Thanksgiving. Um, and um, uh, Hartman comes to us with the most beautiful title of his talk, There is Nothing Left to Colonize But Ourselves. Thank you for that title. I, I love having that in our archives. Um, Hartman is an artist and educator who is an enrolled member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Hartman has been involved in activism advocating for native rights and environmental preservation for the majority of his life, traveling nationally and abroad to learn from and advocate for issues affecting native people. Hartman, thank you for being with us. Well, Thank you for having me, Dane. I uh, appreciate it. Oh. Hey, the world today. And in that, um, we have a big anniversary coming up, 400 years of colonization for people in Massachusetts. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a heavy burden. And it's something that we need to, to really look at. Um, you know, for, for us, the, the colonized, it's not a, a pleasant thing to remember, to commemorate, to, to set our clocks to. Um, but let's let's really stop and think about colonization because it's not just a thing of the past. It's not just uh, something that happened so long ago. It's something that's a process. It's necessarily a process of unjust, violent dispossession of of a people of what's their rightful inheritance, of what's their rightful freedoms and their rightful place in this world, and. You know, so let's let's stop and think about this this event that happened so long ago that still impacts our lives today. You know, the Mayflower crossed the ocean. To live different than what they were allowed to live in the land they had come from. You know, they say that they were seeking religious freedom and many of them were, they were seeking the freedom to be able to practice a form of religion that they felt was what was intended for them and was not allowed by the crown, uh, was not allowed by the 
established authorized churches of the government in England. And this is a part of what pushes people around this, this need to control every aspect of, of a people's actions, behaviors, thoughts, ability to navigate through the world. So folks need to be free. That's a, a human need. Uh, it's not just it's not just a desire or an ideal. It's a it's a deep seated need within us as as living beings, as as animals that are on this earth. And you know the the folks who crossed the water they took great risks to get here, and when they got here, they chose instead of looking back and saying what is it that we are escaping, and how do we make sure that we don't have to live with those same forms of oppression that caused us such unhappiness, they simply sought to exchange the places and the dynamics of power once they arrived here. So they sought to establish the religion that they were prosecuted for, persecuted for in Europe as the means of persecuting the people of this land. They used the laws of the crown from England, which they sought to escape, to dispossess the people of their lands here. And this very process, of course, once again, produces the very same results of oppression and lack of freedoms and the, the crushing of the human spirit that is the very thing that they sought to escape. But this goes beyond just the human spirit. This is a system, this system of consolidating of power, of, of taking all of the power that you can harness of the community, of the nation, of the society, and focusing it in on just a few. It's a part of, of what it is to be under a, uh, a monarchy system. Uh, it's a part of what colonization does. It dispossesses, you know, the far reaches of the world for the enrichment of the one figurehead nation, the one crown. And, you know, the, the crown gave charters to go across the oceans into people's lands that were non-Christian, non-white, and ignore the inherent rights and freedoms that these people had to, to possess things, to possess their land, to, to have decisions within their family, to choose how to pray, to, to farm and eat as they saw fit, to use the land as they saw fit. Um, and these charters were given without any regards to the idea that they're, they're people in these places, they didn't owe their allegiance to these crowns, that didn't have the rule of law of these foreign nations in their land. And what we see today, we see this same thing going on. And uh, what we saw from the very beginning of these colonize, colonization projects, uh, a colony is essentially given a charter by the crown, a corporate charter. This is the same thing that happens when, you know, uh, when Chevron Oil incorporated, it incorporates under a charter, uh, a mandate of rules of how it's supposed to behave and a description of who it's supposed to enrich. And often a mandate to do whatever it can to enrich those handful of, of beneficiaries at the expense of everyone else and anything else without regards to, to local law, without regards to damage to the future, the environment or people's freedoms. You know? uh, the Mayflower passengers, I feel like a lot of them were devout in their ideals for, for what they sought out to be a, a way of, of worship. And like we see even today, these things are exploited oftentimes. Uh, and exploited for the benefit of, of those people in power. Um, 
when they left and they got on board the Mayflower, they didn't intend to land in Plymouth. They intended to land in Jamestown, an established colony where they would be able to um, create a life that had support of, of people who had come from Europe before them to, to lay the groundwork. But that's not where they landed. And funny enough, they landed where the investors had everything to benefit from them expanding into new territories. Uh, when John Smith came up the coast, or no, I'm sorry, no, it was when Dermer came across in 1614, one of the notes he sent back to the investors was that Plymouth would be the ideal placement for the next new colony. And lo and behold, these sailors that are so anxious to get them off the ship and can't wait to get rid of them, decide that a storm blows them off course and lands them right where the investors hope to start anew. So how much of that was the storm and how much of that is just the wills of the people who sought to exploit for profit? How much of this is a matter of co consolidation of power and exploitation of people's zeal and belief and, and sincere you know, dedication to what their ideals are, and yet those things are exploited. You know, what we see is is a system that brings in uh, a, a, a pattern of violent land dispossession, of uh, illegal transfer of land through uh, illegal sales, um, of of forced relocation, inch by inch that people were pushed out of of uh, commodification of natural resources, of, of human bondage and human trafficking, and exploitation of human labor. And these are all things that are about the enrichment of the few. The Mayflower passengers had to borrow against these investors and they all borrowed each one of them for their passage and that cost. But at the end of the day, they weren't individually held to their debt. The colony was held as a whole. So even though half of these people died, died on their way across, they were still beholden as a group for the full amount to their investors with half the people to do the work. And, and these things were, were held with, without regard to these folks' condition or their ability to, to meet the demands. Uh, it put a an extreme hardship on these folks and these hardships then push them whether or not their ideals are are the intention of the beginning to steal and violently dispossess people of land these pressures of debt create a push an incentive a necessity for them to act in these ways of dispossessing people of land of 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 commodification of resources of finding a way to exploit people's labor and 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 we see these same things happening today. It's a process we've watched and we've watched it come across the whole of the United States, the whole of the Americas, across the Pacific, uh, throughout the whole entire world. They said at one point, the sun didn't set on the English empire. And that was because any place that you went across the whole world, the sun was signing someplace on British soil. Uh, and, and this is the truth of the time. Um, and what we see now, you know, in these modern day era, 400 years later, is that the same systems of oppression, the same intolerance, the same greed that is manufactured, this push to push regular people to act in ways that they know is unjust, unfair, uh, immoral, and wrong, to satisfy the debts, to satisfy the economic oppression that people are put under to do things that they might otherwise never consider. Um, and uh, we continue to see many of these things. Uh, land dispossession is such a huge problem with corporation. We call it gentrification now. Uh, but even outside the cities, one of the things that we've seen is a huge dip dispossession of, of local and, and family farmers to these big corporate agribusinesses. Um, you know, this commodification of, of natural resources that we see is, is not just in the form of, of claiming cornfields now or, or, 
or clear cutting of timber. This is a matter of actually modifying the life itself. So that now we have corn that can't regrow itself because it has genes that have been scientifically spliced in so that the seed won't grow. And this is all about profit. It's not about feeding people. It's about how companies and how investors control the food source and make that into a source of profit. Um, we see a continuation of human bondage and human trafficking. Uh, the prison system is now one of the major economic uh, forces in this country, and it has a huge profit margin where people are put into jail for minor offenses, forced to labor and produce goods for a, an economy um, that, that strips them of their every freedom in order to, to make these products for a cheaper, higher profit, uh, lower quality way of life for everyone. Um, we see people profiting off of human trafficking. We see the borders that are a continuation of, of these processes of dispossessing indigenous people of their children. Something that we've seen in the boarding schools where they stripped us of our culture, our language, uh, killing almost half of the children who went through those boarding schools. Almost half the children that went through the boarding schools did not survive to make it home. And and now we see this again. It's a, a forced relocation of indigenous people off their homelands uh, from processes of colonization that oftentimes now benefit the United States rather than the crown of England. And yet it's it's pushed its way through, through Mexico, through Honduras, through Venezuela. Uh, we see these overreaches of power that are continuing uh, active talks of disrupting Venezuela's elected government uh, for the benefit of the oil needs of the United States. Um, now, whether or not we agree with their politics, it's their, their identity as, as an independent sovereign nation to be able to decide their own governance and their own system of how they operate. It's up to them, not to us whether or not their oil will benefit the United States or the citizens of Venezuela. And, and this whole process we see again and again, and it's still a sickness that's within us. And these processes of, of where we even look at oil and like I say, the strip mining, the turning of timber into commodity of GMO corn, of GMO salmon, of, you know, that they're looking to release into, you know, into the world, a, a genetically modified organism. And this is, if this happens, then who knows what's next? You know, are we going to have lab grown cows or pigs that are mixing with the population and causing who knows what, uh, what might come of those genetic changes, those genetic changes that come down to genes and diseases like COVID-19 you know, forms a new, new biology in these animals, these newly created animals and these new sicknesses that come in them. Um, we don't know what will happen and we don't know how to react and respond to all of these things. Oftentimes these, you know, these new animals that are brought into contact and and with other things are, cause huge problems. It's a part of what caused the coast to be cleared out to allow room for the, the Mayflower passengers to even have a space to be was caused from the death of thousands and thousands upon our coast because we had not been in contact with cows or pigs. But now these genetically modified salmon are having sicknesses where they're getting the other salmon that are wild in the ocean sick and who knows what kind of impact that will have among the fish stocks of the whole world, the whole ocean. You know, and we've treat this world as if everything is for the taking and everything is for the enrichment. And we don't see the value of the world that we were given. Uh, we can't see the value of 
of a of a forest for the forest we can only see the value of the forest for the dollar amount that we can get out of the board feet of timber uh, we see them selling the beds of the ocean uh, dividing the ocean as they once divided the land um, and then privatizing and deciding that there's places that people can't go in the water because somebody owns the right to this piece of ocean you know, this is not even a place where we live as people. We don't live on the ocean. Why do we need to claim ownership? It's for the enrichment of the few. It's for the power consolidation. And, and it's a sickness that we are normalizing. It's a sickness that we are teaching. It's a sickness that we are instilling as values within our, our next generations. Uh, we teach people that the measure of humanity is by how much someone can accumulate you know, a, a good person a successful human being has nice homes you know a vacation home in some place nice and a place where they work and accolades and they were able to pay for their masters or their doctorate they are able to have their nice car um they have their their gold or their diamonds, their, their expensive suits. And this is how we value, judge the value of, of human beings against one another. And we teach that the people who can acquire those material things are, are better people and worth more in our society. Um, that this is something that we are supposed to chase and attain with all of everything in our life. And this is something that we really need to step back from and address because we are, we are giving away our lives. We are selling our, our very existence. You know, uh, the, the idea of working 60, 80, bragging about it, 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week, second, third job to be able to barely afford to pay for the, the necessities of life, which, you know, is out of the reach of many people. And this disproportionate um, inequity in how we pursue happiness in this world is, is a part of what leads to these systems that are running and raging out of control. There's no, there should be no reason in today's world that anybody should have to go to a job and work for 80 hours to barely make the needs for themselves and vastly enrich just a few handful of people that then wield the power to, to decide life and death for whole planets. You know, we have seen the wildfires in California produced smoke that blocked out the, 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 the sky here in Boston. I looked up one day and I saw the yellow light shining on the buildings and we saw the, the red orange sun in the sunset and the sunrise from smoke 3000 miles away. This is, this is because we've been destroying the natural balance acting as if we can continuously take and never give back. Um, and this is, this is something we all participate in because of the needs of meeting these basic necessities. You know, what is left to colonize? There's no, there's no piece of ground. There's no piece of ocean. And with the with the way we're treating the world, it seems like there's soon no piece of air even that's left to colonize. There's nothing left but ourselves. Uh, we are the last commodity that they are seeking to, to strip away the, uh, the natural inherent need for freedom, for our spirit, for our, our existence as, as you know, human beings. Um, to be able to live as we were intended to live. And if we don't find a way to change this and empower ourselves and understand the great power that we have in ourselves as human being, and we continually give this power away, 
we give this power away and we don't even realize it. Um, and if we can stop that, if we can change this and change the course on this, we might have a chance, but it's something that we're running out of time to do because everything else has been folded into this system where it benefits the greedy, most you know, self-serving people of the world. The more self-serving, the more greedy you can be, the more you're respected, the more you're empowered, the more that the world admires you. And in order to change this, we have to, each one of us, make these changes in ourselves. And this isn't just a matter of, of where you buy your coffee, but I'm not saying don't think about how you spend your dollars, but it's a matter of how we judge and value and what we decide success and what we decide a good life looks like. And we need to re-examine these things because if we don't, you know, soon the vast majority of the world will have nothing and the few will have nothing as well because it will all be gone for each and every one of us. So, um, you know, we got we to gotta think about the border. We got to think about Venezuela. We got to think about the fires in Africa and Amazon. We got to think about the privatization of the ocean. We got to think about the pollution of the air. We've got to think about all these things and we have to make this change. Um, we have to think about fascism that's on the rise in the United States to allow these things to continue. And we have to break down you know, this system that, that just continuously feeds on our very existence. Uh, we have to starve the beast, as John Trudell says. So, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts. Um, and uh, yeah, I appreciate you all inviting me. Hartman Dietz, thank you so much, Hartman. It's great to hear from you. Um, I want to follow that up with just a, a little piece of show and tell that I have here. This is a, a document that I found in our archives. It, I think it was maybe uh, neglected for 90 years. It was intact and it is the original charter of this church um, uh, that was granted by the, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, to seven original uh, founders of the church. And the reason I, I bring it to your attention is because of what Hartman just told us about. And I think um, that it's, it's embodied in, especially in the very last thought in our, in our founding um, uh, intention. It says the Community Church of Boston uh, for the purpose is created for the purpose of being a free fellowship of men and women dedicated to the fulfillment of social idealism through common service and for the common good. It seeks to cultivate the open mind, the aspiring spirit, the passion for justice, and the application of the cooperative principle to all forms of social and economic life. Especially that cooperative principle is the one that I just dwell on when I think about our church and our community and our in our in our gathering here. Um, uh, some people who have been members of this church are diehard Marxists um, and want us to 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 take on that mantle. Others are are here for a whole variety of reasons. This is a non-sectarian congregation. Uh, affiliated with the Unitarian Universalist Association, but in a way very, very different from any other Unitarian Universalist um, church and service. Uh, but I keep going back to that cooperative principle and uh, just the way that Hartman spoke of it, uh, of the need for that to combat the driving principle of the last 500 years, which is just about selfish, greedy, colonialist capitalism. And um, 
I don't know exactly what it, what it is that I am or that we are, but I know that we are, and I know that we uh, own this building in Copley Square and that we strive to, to uh, promote that cooperative principle and to keep this church afloat and keep this building um, heated and air conditioned. That's what we are spending a lot of time on right now is a new um, uh, project for HVAC, uh, green HVAC in this building. That's why I mentioned to you this basket. This is our collection basket that we pass around right at this time during our regular physical gathering and that I show you um, on, on the video as a way for you to, to help us keep this thing afloat. Uh, with the checks that you can send to the address that is in the chat and or with um, virtual uh, do we do we take Bitcoin I don't know maybe we're not there yet but um, we do do PayPal and credit cards on our website which is communitychurchofboston.org and that's that's the extent of my televangelistic pitch at this at this moment in in our in our broadcast um uh, it's also uh, by way of of bringing back andre strong bear heart gains jr for one last contribution in spanish they sell they they, they say one last intervention Una intervención más, they say, but uh, that almost sounds like a uh, like a, um, uh, uh, a military intervention in some in some country down south, which you know I want to I I'm sorry I keep I, I've got to keep no I'm going to do it after we hear from Andre, I'll hear I'll have one more last word after Andre and then we'll have a Q and A, both of you thank you so much for for being with us and for filling us with inspiration. Andre. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I want to say thank you to Hartman and uh, for sharing those words. Um, I know they're not always easy to share as well. And so um, I want to say thank you for that because, you know, besides it uplifting us in a way, it gives us something to be inspired to. To be able to grow towards and, and moreover be able to share with another who doesn't know like things that need to be known you know and so um, i want to say thank you hartman uh for those words this morning because they were uplifting for me and um they gave me a a, a good good way of thinking this morning and so i want to share this last song with one of my rattles um, I am Nipmuc from Massachusetts. Nipmuc means freshwater people. And uh, as <clears throat> Hartman was singing about, I mean, as he was speaking about um, how food is, is changing and how in some places um, um, we, we can't even eat the, the shellfish or the fish from these shores. Um, um, I just want to, I want to sing a paddle song right now. This is October and for, um, my people as well as the Wampanoag people, uh, um, we usually have, a a paddle to remember, you know, what has happened in Deer Island. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but that's for another long conversation. Um, but, um, it's, we do a sacred paddle and we honor our ancestors that were left there to die. And uh, so I want to sing this paddle song to finish off with you guys. To, um, because of the time of COVID and we're not able to all get together um, um, really the way we want to sing these paddle songs, uh, I'm hoping that maybe it reaches to some of them and uh, uplifts them the way that uh, I've been uplifted today with some of the uh, conversation and, and, um, and song today. So this was written by my cousin, Larry Spotted Crow. Um, thank you for the gift in this song. So, oh. Oh, 
It's a little strange to just sing it like with a rattle by myself right here. <laughs> but I hope that uh, it gifted somebody something that they needed. I want to say thank you for welcoming me here today. Oh, you're still on mute. I couldn't hear you. Thank you, Andre, and uh, say hello, please, to Larry Spotted Crow. He has presented here uh, along with his son about uh, maybe three years ago, and we remember him well. Um, and again, thank you to Hartman. What I wanted to tell you about was, well, a couple of things. I have a little more show and tell. Uh, next Sunday, we have two very special guests. One is named Stephen Kinzer. Stephen has... Uh, uh, presented here all the way back to the, the, the 80s when he was a uh, New York Times journalist in Nicaragua and El Salvador. Um, I remember Stephen's uh, book uh, that really influenced me way back then. It was called Bitter Fruit. It, it was uh, the first really comprehensive telling of the 1954 coup in Guatemala that the United States and basically the United Fruit Company uh, overthrew a uh, popularly elected um, president and put in a succession of, of their own handpicked, uh, mostly military dictators uh, to create a, a genocide that went all the way into the 80s when half a million um, or, I'm sorry, 200,000 or so native people from Guatemala were, were slaughtered during the conflict in the 80s. His most recent book that I've really enjoyed is called The True Flag. Um, and it's, it's a, um, a book about the turn of the century, 19th to the 20th century. And it's all about Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the birth of the American empire. And it's about kind of anti-imperialism back in that age. Anyway, Stephen will be joining us next Sunday. And the music is absolutely a, a phenomenal thing. It's Roy Zimmerman. Uh, this Zoom methodology has freed us from musicians physically being here. And he's calling in from California. Roy is um, a political satirist uh, bar none, the funniest guy. Um, his songs are, are just amazing. And whenever he is touring physically, uh, that is in his car driving all over the country, we drop everything to host Roy Zimmerman here. His most recent one, you, you will find it on YouTube. It's called Vote Him Away. And it's a it's a spoof on a Weem Away, the the song from, of course, from uh, Solomon Linda, Pete Seeger, and then popularized and and commercialized by Walt Disney. Anyway, this this is called Vote Him Away, and it's gotten a gazillion hits, and I hope it has gotten him some some ka ching money as as a result. Roy Zimmerman will be joining us 
to uh, to accompany uh, Stephen Kinzer um, next Sunday. Really looking forward to that program, just as I have enjoyed this program. The week after that, we have um, a, a presentation on prisons, and I show you this T-shirt, which is says Justice Today, and it's it's, it's T-shirts that were made uh, by a group at Norfolk Prison. Uh, who are trying to put together a, a, a regular uh, blog publication. Um, and we have 10 members behind bars uh, who are mostly at Norfolk Prison um, and will join us uh, by phone in two weeks. The, the actual presenter is named Elizabeth Matos and she is the executive director of Prison Legal Services. Uh, of Massachusetts. Uh, so again, that's, that's a, a wonderful program. And the, the musician will be um, this kind of uh, unfamous guy named Dean Stevens. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, uh, but he's a living legend in his own mind. Uh, and um, uh, he will be doing the songs that day. Um, so this is the moment to um, open the floor for questions and answers. And we'd be glad to unmute anybody who wants to unmute themselves uh, to uh, address a question to either Hartman or Andre. You can raise your hands or you can hand or you can put, um, put a, uh, your hand up virtually. There's, is there a, a hand up and hand down? Or you can put a question in the chat if you like. Let's see, I'm gonna uh, scroll through to see if there's any, there is Judith Walcott. Hello, Judy. Um, oh, how are you? There's Judy, we can hear you. Good, good. I, first of all, I just wanna thank Andre. I was deeply, deeply moved by, by your music. And Hartman, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard a clearer presentation of what it's all about. And, and I unfortunately have Mayflower heritage or actually, um, Winslow heritage, but my, my great, great, great grandfather missed the boat. It didn't come over on the Mayflower. So we've always thought maybe that was a, that was a plus in the right direction, but I was deeply, deeply, deeply moved. I don't know when I've ever heard a clearer presentation of, of where it, it all started and where it's going. And I just want to thank you both from the bottom of my heart. Um, thank you. Well, no question. Yeah. No, there's well, no thanks, for, thanks for having us. Thanks for hearing from us. I'm, I am, uh, you know, a Mashpee Wampanoag, and you know, uh, that end of the family have been here about twelve thousand years. Yeah. Uh, but you know, not surprisingly, when you spend four hundred years of uh, being neighbors with people, I'm also, I also descend from a Brewster, so that's you know as well. Oh. I have Mayflower descendant, you know, and that's uh and that's, you know, the truth of often, you know, of our humanity is that they seek to, um, you know, they, they seek to look to divide us and, and think about one, you know, that our humanity is, is dependent on some of these other things, but it's just, it's a part of who we are and we carry all these stories in us. That's right. That's right. And then we have to do something with them. Yeah, that's um, true. You know, that, that's it. But very powerful vote for me. And I thank you. Thank you. Andre, I wanted to just ask you um, about the, the, the Wampanoag, uh, the tribe right now, and uh, their circumstance with that just crazy ruling from the Trump administration saying that, that they were not a, a tribe. This is, the, this is who welcomed uh, or, or not, whatever, the, the Mayflower uh, to their soil, um, and uh, how how has that affected the, the the people recently? And 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 is there a, a process to, I guess you would say, reverse that or or to make it right? Direct that question to Hartman because he's a Wampanoag. I'm Nitwak, and I don't want to speak on his people <laughs> on behalf of his people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like there is certainly validity in, in Andre 
having a, a thought on it. These these things that are coming down the pipe are are test cases, and often will have uh, reverberations that are felt throughout Indian country. Um, and yeah, it'll come back. On Hartman, we might need you to repeat that. We can't hear you. Oh, we got a loss. My back. Yeah. Now, now you're back. You're back. Mm -hmm. In the 1670s, we had to go through an application process to become a praying town, to be given the right to actually have possessions and, and basic fundamental human rights, you know, that we were allowed to own land and to, to be free and not get killed. Uh, we had to apply to see that we could have those same basic fundamental rights that any other human being had. And that was in the 1670s. We went through a process of trying to prove that we met the criteria for basic human dignity. And again and again and again since then, uh, we've had, you know, we've had to go through it in the 1830s and the 1860s and the, um, you know, in, in the it, it's, it's again and again and again. And that's the thing about colonization is I, had talked about earlier it's not this thing that happened in the past it's an ongoing process and it's it's a it's a value system in the world where where you know there it's it's never enough and there's always a desire to take more and as long as we still continue to have anything there's going to be an effort to continue to dispossess us of that because those who uh those who can never be satisfied you know, never will be. And this, if we normalize this and we enshrine it into law and we allow it and we accept it, then the, the next victim will just be the next victim down the road and that will be normalized and it will be harder and harder to stop. Um, and we, we've seen, we've seen this uh, again and again, starting with some of the first people to be colonized and exploited and then and then the next ones get lined up in line until they're all until they have all been processed through the same process of dispossession. So uh, we are facing it. We have a good ruling from the courts with our last go round, and I believe that because we got a good ruling from the court, that the Department of the Interior should validate our land holding and our ability to have jurisdiction over our own land. The Department of the Interior and the Department of Justice are now appealing that decision so that they don't have to give us justice and that they can continue to exploit us and dispossess us for rightful inheritance. And that will go to the Supreme Court and we will see if that dispossession is validated by the law of man or if it's or if uh, morality and justice are able to, to win this time. Uh, so hopefully we see some morality and justice win and more of that and less of, uh, less of immorality enshrined in law. Well, thank you. Um, are there, is there anybody else want to make a comment, observation. Uh, I want to recognize that Joan has written a bunch of things in the, um, in the chat section. I also want to um, point out that uh, if you want to uh, be apprised of, of Indigenous Peoples Day events in the area, you can go to ACTMA, which is uh, another uh, site that's listed in the chat section of our Zoom here, um, facebook.com slash atma org. You see where that is? It's down at the very bottom. Charlie just posted that um, for uh, other events um, around the area. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Jim, go ahead and unmute yourself. Jim Casteris, 
you need to unmute yourself. And I'll tell you when you come in, when you're in. Okay. Mark, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I want to thank the speakers. And the, I'll call them the speakers, the speaker and musician. Incredible, incredible presentation, information that is in my heart somewhere. I, I, I can't really say any more than that. What a beautiful presentation. I, I hope we're able to publish it at some point. And uh, thank you both. Uh, that's my... It will be on our YouTube channel. I'm going to get a, a chance to edit it. I'm going to mute you again, Jim, because of that, that sound. Uh, and, um, well, again, thanks to everybody who has joined us. Thanks to about 20 total who were on the Zoom call, probably another 20, 25 on the YouTube um, uh, of our official channel. And um, I just want to conclude with, with another, I'm just going to read, this is a song written by uh, Floyd Red Crow Westerman. I recorded this song on a, on a CD I published about uh, maybe 12 years ago. And it's a song in Spanish and in, and in English. Uh, that Floyd was fluent in Spanish. He grew up in California. He was a Lakota man. And, and he wrote a bunch of great songs. He was also a uh, Hollywood actor. He was in uh, Dances with Wolves. He was in Little Big Man. He was in a, a bunch of TV shows. Uh, Floyd Red Crow Westerman. Mis hermanos, la tierra es mi madre. Mis hermanas, la tierra es tu madre. My brothers, the earth is my mother. My sisters, the earth is your mother. Mis hermanos, somos la misma sangre. Mis hermanas, somos un solo río. My brothers, we are all the same blood. My sisters, we are one river. Somos un solo río cuando estamos unidos. Seremos millones. We are all one river. When we are united, we will be millions. Y nuestro río correrá libre. And our river will run free. La tierra es mi madre. The earth is my mother. La tierra es nuestra madre. The earth is our mother. Hartman, Dietz, thank you for being with us, and I hope it's not the last time. You are welcome in our auditorium anytime in Copley Square. Same thing for Andre Strong Bear Hart Gaines. It's just a pleasure to have you in our company here at Community Church of Boston. With that, I want to just recognize one, one member who is with us here in the auditorium. And that is Carolyn Quinelli over there. Hi, Dean. Hey, Dean. Is it? Yes. Can Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hartman. I'm sorry. I, I had a trouble like oh, uh, getting up Bluetooth and and into it's phone. I, I have a question. Can I ask a question? Yes, Alan Clemens from Maine. Call <laughs> Go ahead, Alan. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hartman and Andre. Um, Hartman, I, I have a question. <clears throat> Two questions, actually. One's like historical. And that is uh, regarding the, where the, the, the pilgrims, quote unquote, pilgrims landed in Plymouth. Um, and, you know, you, you basically alluded to the, the, the idea that, that it was planned that they end up there. And, and I, I, I agree with that. But I, what I'm wondering is if, if you know any information about sort of why the Boston Harbor area and what is now Boston was off limits to them. And, you know, basically like the crown had it planned that they, that they couldn't be there. They could be on the South shore with poor soils, et cetera, et cetera. But they, they, they certainly could not settle in Boston because there was a plan for the future for that. And they couldn't, you know, have access to like the Concord river Valley, very fertile and so on. So I'm just wondering if, if you know anything about that. And then um, the, my real question pertaining to the, the talk today. Um, I just I make the observation that we we also we talk about 
systems of uh, economic systems like capitalism or socialism, communism, et cetera, and, and the various hybrids of those things. But actually, you know, I would suggest that we have a our, our dominant world economic system is the colonization uh, economic model, and we don't. It's kind of against the rules to to call it that. We, you know, we dress it up in all kinds of names, but but that is the dominant model for the last five or six hundred years, and it still is the dominant model. So I want to um, ask when we I, I just again make the observation that with the recent Black Lives Matter bringing oppression to the forefront, that, you know, we, we, we talk about changing the laws about police and behaviors and this and that, but really until we alter or, or educate ourselves about the real villain, which is this colonial model, you know, what, what can we do? And it's, 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 I mean, nothing will really change. So I, I wonder if you can just comment on that and, uh, sort of tie in other oppressed peoples and cultures to uh, the, the the colonial model of the economics. Thanks. Well, um, you know, it's it, you know why I feel that there was a purposeful landing here, and I do, I alluded to it. Uh, you know, there is not actual solid evidence that says that I can say here with this, this is where they said this, but you know, the, the fact is that information was sent back from Dermer that suggested this is a land spot. Um, why would the first people be put out there that were seen as, as undesirables be put out across to start the new thing. They're going to take the highest casualties. They're going to have the hardest burden um, to to break into a, a new landscape and, and establish themselves there. They're going to see they're going to see the biggest casualties. They're going to see the biggest chance of absolute failure, as they saw in Roanoke. Um, you know, if they see these folks as expendable. To gain a foothold, they're not worried about the loss of, of the lives of those Mayflower passengers any more than they're worried about the loss of lives of children in the border camps. Um, and if that's the if that's the value system that you're looking at, if that's the lack of empathy and lack of humanity that you're willing to deal with these people on. Sure, send them to the bad part, get them started, and then when the and then once they've done all the sacrifice and they've you know taken on all the hardship, then after that, the better parts can be claimed for the people who who are are the elite, who are the favored, who are the chosen. Um, and really, what we saw is a, a you know a much uh, harsher. Um, group of people that were more more loyal to the crown of england to the church of england to calvinism to um you know to to these these systems of law and order that ended up in the massachusetts bay colony um and it wasn't the people that sought religious freedom that were exploited but the people who then followed it in the past that they pushed forward and yeah, colonization is certainly something that we see throughout the world, not only within capitalistic systems, but within communistic systems. Uh, you know, the truth about both communism and capitalism is they're both based on the exploitation of resources. It, it, they're both economic systems. They're based on that as, as how we get through the world. How do we exploit a resource for the 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 monetary and and gain of the, of the state or the or the society or the nation, how it's divided is more equitable, uh, but in, in its base foundation, it's still about humanity and 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 nations having rule and control over the entirety of the earth without any regard for the lives of the trees or the lives of the animals or even really the lives of the citizens and the people in all truth. And this is a problem with both systems. Um, and it's often 
one that both are willing to to ignore or criticize the other and act as if their 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 system is the solution. Uh, I think they both capitalism and communism and socialism and anarchy and and uh, libertarianism they all have things to offer uh they all have means to to offer some insight into the world and how we live in it but no one should be absolute uh it should at the end of the day work for everyone and everything and how we sustain ourselves for a future not just for for the enrichment of nations and powerful people in the now and moment Thanks. Yeah. All right. I just got a, uh, a text from Diane Nassif in Western Mass uh, asking for that, uh, that quote from, from Eduardo Galeano. I am going to type it up and, uh, and put it in, in a, on our Facebook page. Uh, if you'd like, I can also just do what I did with Diane, which is uh, take a picture of, of that page and, and send it to you. Be glad to do that. Just, just let me know. Um, so um, we have people who joined us from Western Mass. We have two, two folks who joined us from Maine. And we have uh, several unidentified folks who I don't know exactly even who they are. Welcome, um, all of you. Uh, I won't uh, embarrass you by mentioning you by name because that's maybe not why you joined us. Hopefully you joined us for the inspiration of these wonderful speakers we've had this morning. Um, again, I wanna thank you Hartman and thank you Andre. Let's give them a round of applause. Sometimes we unmute everybody. So it, it almost sounds like as if uh, there were a stadium full of people applauding you uh, because you were a, a rock star. But uh, this, is, this is the best we can do among our tiny little congregation is, is just thank you uh, very much for, for joining us um, and, uh, and tell you all to tell your friends about, about this gathering every Sunday morning. Tell, uh, and uh, if you would like, send us an email. We will add you to our mailing list. Come church, C-O-M-M. C-H-U-R-C-H at gmail.com is the easiest one to, to get to us. And we will add you to our list and keep you abreast of a whole bunch of great programs that are coming this fall and this winter. In this, our 100th season of existence at Community Church of Boston. Thank you, folks. I'm going to say goodbye and end the meeting. Meeting at the building soon be over all over this world all over this world, all over this world. Hartman, Andre, thanks one more time and thank you all for joining us. And we sign off at 12.32 p.m. You can check us out on the YouTube if you want to uh, see it again. Bye. Goodbye. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>